Oh, hey, how are you? Let's have a little bit more of Terry Pratchett's. Ready? Gads, gads! I don't know why I have to do it in such a shrieky pitch. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, last night, do you remember, we stopped it at a weird place, didn't we? So um, tonight we'll pick it up from the weird place, and but we'll go tonight to a sensible stop. Remember me saying it was 20 pages till the next sensible stop? Of course, tonight is only 10 pages. Okay, here we go. Fimes listened. They would never have survived at all except that their home swamps were isolated and short of predators. Not that a dragon made good eating anyway. Once you'd taken away the leathery skin and the enormous flight muscles, what was left must have been like biting into a badly run chemical factory. No wonder dragons were always ill. They relied on permanent stomach trouble for supplies of fuel. Most of their brain power was taken up with controlling the complexities of their digestion, which could distill flame-producing fuels from the most unlikely ingredients. They could even rearrange their internal plumbing overnight to deal with difficult processes. Pause. I wish I could do that. Unpause. They lived on a chemical knife edge the whole time. One misplaced hiccup and they were geography. <laughs> when it came to choosing nesting sites, the females had all the common sense and mothering instinct of a brick. Pause. Anchorman. <laughs> Unpause. Vimes wondered why people had been so worried about dragons in the old days. If there was one in a cave near you, all you had to do was wait until it self-ignited, blew itself up, or died of acute indigestion. You've really studied them, haven't you? He said, well, someone ought to. But what about the big ones? Golly, yes, they're a great mystery, you know, she said, her expression becoming extremely serious. Yeah, you said, there are legends, you know, it seems as though one species of dragon started to get bigger and bigger and then just vanished. Died out, you mean? No, they turn up sometimes from somewhere full of vim and vigour and then one day they stopped coming at all. She gave Vimes a triumphant look. I think they found somewhere where they could really be. Really be what? Dragons! where they could really fulfil their potential. Some other dimension or something, where the gravity isn't so strong, or something. I thought when I saw it, said Vimes, I thought you can't have something that flies and has scales like that. They looked at each other. We've got to find its lair, said Lady Rumpkin. No flying newt sets fire to my city, said Vimes. Just think of the contribution to dragon law said Lady Rumkin. Listen, if anyone set ever sets fire to this city, it's going to be me. It's an amazing opportunity. So many questions. You're right there. A phrase of carrots crossed Vime's mind. It can help us with our inquiries, he suggested. But in the morning, Lady Rumkin said firmly. Vime's look of bitter determination failed. I shall sleep downstairs in the kitchen. I usually have a camp bed made up down there when it's egg-laying time. Some of the females always need assistance. Don't you worry about me. You've been very helpful, Vimes muttered. I've sent Nobby down to the city to help the others set up your headquarters, said Lady Rampkin. Vimes had completely forgotten the watch house. Must have been badly damaged, he ventured. Totally destroyed, said Lady Rampkin. Just a patch of melted rock, so I'm letting you have a place in Pseudopolis Yard. Sorry? No, oh, my father had property all over the city, she said. Quite useless to me, really. So I told my agent to give Sergeant Cole on the keys to the old house in Pseudopolis Yard. It'll be good to be aired. But that area, I mean, there's real cobbles on the streets. The rent alone. I mean, Lord Veterinary, what, don't you worry about that, she said, giving him a friendly pat. Now, you really ought to get some sleep. Vimes lay in bed, his mind racing. Sotopolis Yard was on the Ankh side of the river, in quite a high-rent district. The sight of Nobby or Sergeant Colon walking down the street in daylight would probably have the same effect on the area as the opening of a plague hospital. He dozed, gliding in and out of sleep, where giant dragons pursued him, waving jars of ointment, and awoke to the sound of a mob. There is a sensible stop there. I didn't notice that one. I'll carry on. 
Lady Rampkin drawing herself up haughtily was not a sight to forget, although you could try. It was like watching continental drift in reverse as various subcontinents and islands pulled themselves together to form one massive angry proto-woman. The broken door of the dragon house swung on its hinges. The inmates, already as highly strung as a harp on amphetamines, were going mad. Little gouts of flame burst against the metal plates as they stampeded back and forth in their pens. What, she said, is the meaning of this? If a rampkin had ever been given to introspection, she'd have admitted that it wasn't a very original line. But it was handy, it did the job. The reason that cliches become cliches is that they are the hammers and screwdrivers in a toolbox of communication. The mob filled the broken doorway. Some of it was waving various sharp implements with the up and down motion prior to proper to rioters. Whoa, said the leader. That's the dragon, innit? There was a chorus of muttered agreement. What about it? said Lady Rampkin. Well, that's has been burning the city. I don't fly far. You got dragons here. Could be one of them, couldn't it? Yeah, that's right. QED. So, oh, what we're going to do is we're going to put them down. That's right, yeah. Pro bono publico. Lady Ramkin's bosom rose and fell like an empire. <laughs> she reached out and grabbed the dungeon fork from its hook on the wall. One step nearer. I warn you, you will be sorry, she said. The leader looked beyond her to the frantic dragons. Yeah, he said nastily. And what would you do, huh? Her mouth opened and shut once or twice. I... I shall summon the watch. The threat did not have the effect she had expected. Lady Rampkin had never paid much attention to those bits of the city that didn't have scales on. Well, that's too bad, said the leader. That's really worrying, you know that. Makes me go all weak on my knees, that does. He extracted a lengthy cleaver from his belt. And now, you just stand aside, lady, because... A streak of green fire blasted out of the back of the shed, passed a foot over the heads of the mob and burned a charred rosette in the woodwork over the door. Then came a voice that was a honeyed purr of sheer deadly menace. This is Lord Mountjoy Quickfang Winterforth the Fourth, the hottest dragon in the city. It could burn your head clean off. Captain Vimes limped forward from the shadows. A small and extremely frightened golden dragon was clamped firmly <laughs> under one arm. His other hand held it by the tail. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> uh, fine, fine, fine. The rioters all watched it hypnotise. Now I know what you're thinking, Vimes went on softly. You're wondering, after all this excitement, has he got enough flame left? And you know, I ain't so sure myself. He leaned forward, sight in between the dragon's ears, and his voice <laughs> and his voice buzzed like a knife blade. I got I could just imagine <laughs> holding a dragon like that like a gun. Ah oh, dear LOL What you've got to ask yourself is Am I feeling lucky? They swayed backwards as he advanced. Well, he said, Ah, you feeling lucky? For a few moments, the only sound was Lord Mountjoy Quickfang Windforth's fourth stomach rumbling ominously as fuel sloshed into his flame chambers. No, no, look, look, uh, said the leader, his eyes fixed hypnotically on the dragon's head. There's no call for anything like that. In fact, he might just decide to flare off all by himself, said Vimes. They have to do it to stop the gas building up. It builds up when they get nervous and, you know, I reckon you've made them all pretty nervous right now. The leader made what he hoped was a vaguely conciliatory gesture, but unfortunately did it with the hand that was still holding a knife. Drop it, said Vimes sharply, or you are history. The knife clanged on the flagstones. There was a scuffle at the back of the crowd as a number of people, metaphorically speaking, were a long way away and knew nothing about it. But before the rest of you good citizens disperse quietly and go about your business, said Vimes meaningfully, I suggest you look hard at these dragons. 
Do any of them look 60 feet long? Would you say they have got an 80 foot wingspan? How hot do they flame, would you say? Uh, I don't know, said the leader. Vimes raised the dragon's head slightly. The leader rolled his eyes. Don't know, sir. Don't know, sir. He corrected. Do you want to find out? The leader shook his head, but he did manage to find his voice. Uh, who are you, anyway? Vimes drew himself up. I am Captain Vimes, City Watch, he said. <laughs> This met with almost complete silence. <laughs> I can imagine it. The exception was the cheerful voice somewhere in the back of the crowd which said, Night shift, is it? Vimes looked down at his night shirt. <laughs> in his hurry to get off his sick bed, he'd shuffled hastily into a pair of Lady Ramkin's slippers for the first time he saw that they had pink pom-poms on them. And it was at this moment that Lord Mountjoy Quickfang Winterford IV chose to belch. It wasn't another stab of roaring fire. It was just a near invisible ball of damp flame which rolled over the mob and singed a few eyebrows, but definitely made an impression. Vimes rallied magnificently. They couldn't have noticed his brief moment of sheer horror. <laughs> that one was just to get your attention, he said, poker faced. The next one. It's going to be a bit lower. Uh, right you are. No problem. We were just going anyway. No big dragons here. Right enough. Sorry you've been troubled. Oh, no, said Lady Rampkin triumphantly. You don't get away that easily. She reached up onto a shelf and produced a tin box. It had a slot in the lid. It rattled. On the other side was the legend... The Sunshine Sanctuary for Sick Dragons. The initial whip round produced $4.31. After Captain Vimes gestured pointedly with the dragon, a further $25.16 were miraculously forthcoming. Then the mob fled. Made a profit on the day anyway, said Vimes when they were alone again. That was jolly brave of you. Let's just hope it doesn't catch on, said Vimes, gingerly putting the exhausted dragon back in its pen. He felt quite light-headed. Once again, he was aware of eyes staring fixedly at him. He glanced sideways into the long-pointed face of good boy Bindle Featherstone, rearing up in a pose best described as the last puppy in the shop. To his astonishment, he found himself reaching over and scratching it behind its ears, or at least behind the two spiky things at the side of its head, which were presumably its ears. It responded with a strange noise that sounded like a complicated blockage in a brewery. He took his hand away hurriedly. It's all right, said Lady Rankin. It's his stomach's rumbling. That means he likes you. To his amazement, Vimes found that he was still rather pleased to hear this. As far as he could recall, nothing in his life before had thought him worth a, l worth a burp. I thought you, um... I thought you were going to get rid of him. I suppose I shall have to, she said. You know how it is, though. They look up at you with those big, soulful eyes. There was a brief, mutual, awkward silence. How would it be if I... You don't think you might like... They stopped. It'd be the least I could do, said Lady Rumpkin. But you already given us the new headquarters and everything. That was simply my duty as a good citizen, said Lady Rumpkin. Please, accept good boy as a, as a friend. Vimes felt that he was being inched out over a very deep chasm on a very thin plank. I don't even know what they eat, he said. They're omnivores, actually. They eat everything except metal and igneous rock. You can't be finicky, you see, when you evolve in a swamp. But doesn't he need to be taken for walks or flights or whatever? He seems to sleep most of the time. She scratched the ugly thing on top of its scaly head. He is the most relaxed dragon I've ever bred, I must say. What about, um, you know, he indicated the dunging fork. Well, it's mainly gas. Just keep them somewhere well ventilated. You haven't got any valuable carpets, have you? It's best not to let them lick your face, but they can be trained to control their flame. They're very helpful for lighting fires, you know. Good boy Bindle Featherstone curled up amidst a barrage of plumbing noises. They've got eight stomach, Vimes remembered. The drawings in the books had been very detailed, and there's lots of other stuff like fractional distillation tubes and mad alchemy sets in there. 
No swamp dragon could ever terrorise a kingdom except by accident. Fimes wondered how many had been killed by Enterprise and heroes. It was terribly cruel to do something like that to creatures whose only crime was to blow themselves absent-mindedly to pieces in mid-air, which was not something any individual dragon made a habit of. It made him quite angry to think about it. A race of of whittles, that's what dragons were, born to lose, live fast, die wide, omnivores or not. What they must really live on was their nerves flapping apologetically through the world in mortal fear of their own digestive system. The family would be just getting over father's explosion. Some twerp in a suit of armour would come plodding into the swamp to stick a sword into a bag of guts that was only st one step away with self-destruction in any case. Pfft. It'd be interesting to see how the great dragon slayers of the past stood up to the big dragon. Armour? Best not to wear it. It'd be all the same in any case. And at least your ashes wouldn't come pre-packaged in their own foil. He stared and stared at the malformed little thing and the idea that had just been knocking for attention for the last few minutes finally gained entrance. Everyone in Ankh-Morpork wanted to find the dragon's lair. At least, wanted to find it empty. Bits of wood on a stick wouldn't do it, he was certain. But, as they said, set a thief? He said, could one dragon sniff out another? I mean, follow the scent? So, in that little section, there's been a little bit of <whistles> between Vimes and Ramkin. The City Watch have got a new headquarters and a new pet. Wow. So they've gone from the Night Watch to the City Watch. Apart from it was the Night Watch when he rocked up in <laughs> Nightshirt and Flippy. Fl flippy? Fluffy slippers. <laughs> okay. I forgot to blow my candle out last night. Sorry, Melanie. Here we go. <gasps> there you go. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And I'll see you tomorrow. Night-night. Unless you're here for a bit of chit -a chat. Uh, did you see on um, my channel that I've made myself uh -huh. a new thumbnail. I did that using AI. It's a thing called Copilot. And you can literally... You can't see it very well there. Oh, there's, not, there's nothing really I can show you. Oh, here it is. Look. Copilot. There it is. You can, um, you can literally ask it, like, to make you anything. That's cool. So I, I said to her earlier on, make me a new thumbnail that said Mr. S does a story. And it did it. <laughs> How impressive is that? So um, I'm going to do some more later on, see what else I can come up with on there. I tried to do a banner and I made a banner. I wonder if I can show you that. Here it is. So I'm, I made a banner as well. There it is. Look. It's a bit shiny in the middle, but... um. There you go. I made a banner, but the dimensions are different. So when I try to upload, it all went wrong. So I'll keep my old banner. I don't know how to change the dimensions of it. But um, yeah, that's so impressive, isn't it? I'm going to see what else AI can do. <gasps> what a scary world we live in. <laughs> it's drawing pictures for YouTube. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's what, that's what I've done today. I uh, took my car out earlier. Bo is like, he's my third born. And he has never paid any interest in clothing whatsoever, even anything material. He, he, like he just doesn't want for anything. Like he, could, he could. He's the only one of my children who can save his pocket money, because bless him, he's happy with what he's got. He never wants anything, even at Christmas time. He's like, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. he doesn't. He doesn't want for anything. But over the last couple of days, because he loves basketball, he decided, I really want some basketball trainers. <laughs> so he researched on the internet, best basketball trainers. Of course, they were those brand, which I don't suppose I'm allowed to mention on here, will I? Otherwise, I'll get demonetized or whatever it's called, defabricated. Um, 
but they were like a couple hundred quid, so obviously he ain't going to get them. But he found some on there that he had enough money from Christmas for. So I, I drove him up into the town earlier on, and we went and got him. He then asked for the person for the right size, so I had to do the talking for him. But he got a pair with his Christmas money, and yeah, that's where I've been today. So I went into town and got a new pair of basketball trainers with Bo. So that was that was a nice little trip. It's, it's not very often that it's just me and him. It's often just me and Floyd, very often just me and Phoebe, sometimes me and Blake. But it is never just me and Bo. It's always me, Bo, and someone. So that was nice. That's what I did with my day today. Um I um I did something a bit wicked last night as well. <laughs> I'm desperately trying to lose weight, desperately trying to lose weight because I, I feel a, like a little bit of a heifer at the moment. Um, but what I did after I got off the old recording last night, I went and ordered pizza and I put it home and the boys were in bed. I ate the pizza in bed. <laughs> I hate eating up in the bedroom, but I put a movie on my laptop I was sat in bed and ate a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did last night. So, um, of course, I saved some, which was cold for the boys' breakfast because they love cold pizza breakfast. Um, but that didn't really help my um, my little quest for losing weight. But yeah, that's what I did last night. Uh, anything else I've done today? Mm, I've been reading a new book. I've been reading this one. Ever read that one before? It's not it's not a very thick book, look, but um, and it's pretty old as well. But yeah, I just I read it because I found it cheap on Tinternet, so I got it and I've been reading that one cheap. Let me know if you've ever read that one before. I'm not going to read it on here because it's not really content for on here. But that's what I've been doing today. Um, what else have I done? Hmm. Bo had some maths homework to do, all about angles within. Uh, within quadrilaterals, so we've been doing that. No, that's that's it. Just been getting ready to go back to work tomorrow, really. So yeah, that's my day. My car felt a little bit better today. I I parked it. Normally I park it out on the road, but today or last night when I got home from from with the pizzas. I parked it so two wheels were up on the curb, so it was tilted a little bit, and I thought maybe that'll trickle some water out. It was a little bit jerky as I drove it this morning to get, or this afternoon to get um, trainers, but actually not as bad as it had been. So hopefully that's good news. But I like I said, I, I did email the garage yesterday, so hopefully they'll get back to me tomorrow. We'll see, won't we? All right, okay. Thanks for listening to me, Grizzle, and I'll see you all tomorrow.